Let's talk about a pith and substance analysis. So the pith and substance doctrine is used to figure out which head of power that a given piece of legislation will fall under. This uh, pith and substance doctrine primarily used when a law is challenged on the basis that either the provincial or federal government has stepped on the toes of another level of government. So this doctrine will look at the validity of the scheme and or the specific sections or parts of the scheme that may be in conflict. And it is basically looking for the subject matter or the dominant purpose of the law, hence pith and substance. So when you're writing such an analysis on an exam, you must answer two questions. What is the essential character of the law, number one? And number two, does the law relate to an enumerated head of power in section 91 or 92 of the Constitution Act, where they outline whether certain things should be provincial or federal? Uh, so then looking at character, we want to look to the legal effects of the law, uh, how the law will affect rights and liabilities. So what does the law do? Case, Reference Re Firearms Act. Um, the effect of the law can also reveal whether the law is colorable. So whether the law appears to address something other than the substance is showing. Uh, see case Morgan Tiller. Courts will look at extrinsic evidence in this case, such as debates or speeches or reports. Also, the court will look at the mischief that the law was designed to remedy. Uh, and they, again, this will look at extrinsic evidence. So determine the actual dominant purpose of the law and outline your conclusions regarding the pith and substance. If the actual purpose diverges from the stated purpose, if it's different than the stated purpose, then there may be a problem of colorability. And so mention that if so. Okay, steps of this analysis. Step one, given the pith and substance, the effect which we've just determined, who are the relevant heads of power? So if federal, if it's uh, not enumerated, is this a matter of POG, peace, order, and good government? Is this an uh, emergency power being activated? Is this a matter of national concern? See case Crown Zellerbach. National concern is separate and distinct from the emergency as it's not temporary. Um, is this a residual power? So matters <laughs> that fall outside of the enumerated classes in 91 and 92 um, may still fall under a residual power. And then is this a criminal law? Does the law have a valid criminal law purpose? So some of those valid purposes would be public peace, order, security, health, morality, uh, case margin reference, which is quoted in the firearms reference case. Uh, protection of the environment is also included as a valid criminal law purpose, Hydro-Quebec case. To be classified as a valid criminal law, that purpose must be connected to a prohibition backed by a penalty, firearms reference case. And is there a specific section that applies like unemployment insurance, banking, marriage, specific powers enumerated in section 91. Okay, if this is a uh, provincial, then the specific powers will be enumerated in section 92. We'll also include property and civil rights in matters of a merely local and private nature. Um, private between people or individual transactions. Uh, keep an eye out here for incidental effects. What effects does this legislation have on the other government's powers? Um, is the question. So if the effects are just incidental, 
uh, just barely stepping on the toes, then that is fine. It does not undermine the validity of the law. But if at this point you have recognized that the law is stepping on the toes of the other government's head of powers, then this law might be invalid. And this is because we want to try to maintain a balanced federalism. Note here that the double aspects doctrine allows for more than one level of government to legislate regarding similar subject matters. So it is okay if they do overlap. The question is, um, is this overlapping in a way that conflicts with each other? So let's take a look at step two of this analysis. If this is about a specific section in the legislation, then you'll use the ancillary powers doctrine analysis. And this is if the specific section is constitutionally impugned, but is still located within constitutionally valid law, then you may apply a remedy to either strike down or read down that section or apply an individual remedy. Um, if you make it past this, or if, then you'll go to step three. If it's about two valid laws, federal and provincial, then you'll use the paramountcy doctrine or the paramountcy operability. And this is uh, a narrow uh, definition of conflict. And if dual compliance is impossible, or the dual compliance would frustrate the federal purpose, then the remedy should be in favor of the federal and not the provincial. Hence, paramountcy, meaning federal dominance. Step four, uh, interjurisdictional immunity applicability. Uh, so this, you're going to assess the applicability of the law to the entity, person, or thing regulated by the other level of the government, and you'll ask whether this law entrenches on the protected core of a federal or provincial competency. So look at the basic minimum unassailable core content, very core, and interpret narrowly the minimum content necessary to make the power effective for the purpose for which it was conferred. Um, this should impact a vital and essential part of the undertaking or power. And then ask whether the effect of the provincial law is sufficiently serious to invoke this doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity. Um, so, and there must be impairment for this interjurisdictional immunity applicability to apply. Okay, so we have gone over the basics here of a pith and substance analysis in which we're determining the head of powers and the extent of the infringement on either one, if there even is one. Remember that the courts typically allow a broad, very broad, they give a broad allowance for the double aspect. Um, so the double aspects doctrine, which allows for more than one level of government to legislate, it would have to be a fairly serious infringement for, uh, for a remedy to be applied. But uh, such is the case, especially read the case Morgan Tiller. Read that one in its entirety. Uh, best of luck on your upcoming exams. Click like, click subscribe, check out these other videos on constitutional law and eventually even more uh, Canadian law and NCA exam prep down here in the corner and best of luck to you on your upcoming exams.